Filadenko is an extraordinary elite concert dance company that has brought together dancers, choreographers, an artistic director, and ideas in such a particular way that frequently audiences are delighted and sometimes even enlightened. And Joan Bias Brown, she is the fulcrum. She's the anchor. She's the agent, the force of change that makes things happen. She has brought to bear the power and beauty and intensity of both her biological and her aesthetic ancestors to create a company and an ensemble, an offering of intense and eloquent body language. That was her vision 50 years ago, this company, to have a place where she can build the best artists. Her legacy is her dedication and commitment to the arts, to her school, to her students, to the company, and the companies that have grown from that. That is something that anybody who knows her, anyone who wants to be a part of the continuum, is going to have to keep that alive. There's a four-year-old kid say to me, I can't wait to be in Philadelphia. I'm like, I hope it's here. I think there's a place for it in our community and, and in the field. But uh, planning for it, I don't know. We had five different succession plans. We never get there. book, I spend about 50 pages describing what I call the Philodenko aesthetic. It's a hard work, work your butt off aesthetic based on old school traditions that come out of the African American community, that also come out of the old school European ballet community. And while you're doing that, you are always reaching for the sublime. There is no truth that black bodies cannot do ballet or that black bodies are different than white bodies. Bodies are trained to do what they need to do. They think clinging to the European perception of the all white ballets and all the ballerinas looking just alike, that putting a black girl in the line or making a black girl a principal would not be the aesthetic that way that the European. And I'm still fighting that the ballet should look like America, but it's, it's still a hard fight. I was born in 1931 in the era of segregation. And I went to an all black school and black community she mentioned that when she was seven or eight, she broke a foot because she was playing curb tag with her friends in the street, kind of thing that city kids do, and I broke her foot. And uh, the doctors suggested that she take dance classes to strengthen this foot. My mother, during the war, when the men went to work, my mother was in college, and she got a job because she... Um, was majoring in chemistry. She ended up being a research and chemical engineer. So, of course, she wanted to, me to be involved with so-called social things. Essie Marie Dorsey, the mother of this whole community, was teaching dance classes. JB took classes at Miss Dorsey's studio. So all of this started to strengthen the feet, but there was this kid who seemed to have some promise, but JB wasn't really interested. So I didn't get involved with dance again until I was in high school. Good morning, Miss Joan Lyons Brown. 
When I got in high school, my gym teacher, who had been a member of the Littlefield Ballet, which was America's first classic ballet, she, at that time, you couldn't go to college and get a degree in dance. So she had to be a gym teacher. But after school, she had a ballet club. And she invited me to come to the ballet club. She said, you should dance. I'm like, I can dance. You know? <laughs> she said, no, you should dance. She said, come to the ballet club. Of course, when I get to the ballet club, there's nobody black there but me. But I made friends with a girl. She used to meet me in the morning before school at 7.30 and she would teach me what she learned the night before at her dancing school so that when I got to the ballet club, when they start saying Glissad Arabes, and all, I would halfway know what they were talking about and that I could halfway follow. JB is part of the ballet club and really gets to loving it very much. Wants to take classes outside of high school, but none of the white dance studios will have black students there. Marion Suget, along with Sidney King, was a really important teacher and mentor for Joan Myers Brown. I was teaching for Sidney King, then she had her school. First was Sidney Marion School. Then they split, the Judah Mar became one school and the Sidney School became another school. At that time, all the stuff I was learning at high school, they weren't teaching. So I was teaching stuff that people didn't get other than what I got secondhand. People kind of relied on me. They considered me a good ballet teacher in the black community. The local dance schools would always do part of the cotillion. It was a cultural event of the black community for years. I used to choreograph it and teach it. It was quite exciting because we almost felt like we were in Hollywood. Marion Suget and Sidney King had actually both studied with Essie Marie Dorsey. So there's a, an interesting lineage that we see in the black Philadelphia dance community from Essie Marie Dorsey to all the people who studied with her. When Joan opens her school, Marion Suget becomes the ballet teacher there. So a real old school sense of tradition and, and passing down the torch. At some point, JB also gets a scholarship, and so she commutes to New York to go to the famous Katherine Dunham studio. So she regains a dance consciousness in high school, and then thereafter, that becomes her path. JB has this never-ending love of ballet, and ballet in an old-school sense of ballet. Um, you know, tutus and all of that. And one of her teachers was Anthony Tudor, British who came to Philadelphia to teach once a week at the Philadelphia Ballet Guild and didn't realize that he wasn't supposed to have black people in his classes. So he invited JB and Billy Wilson as well to take classes. The white male dancers, when it got to the pas de deux, the duet numbers in the class, they would not partner Joan. Mr. Tudor, Mr. Anthony Tudor, partnered her in class. Now what incredible learning experience. I felt like, why shouldn't I be able to do this if I wanted to? Well, when I couldn't get a job, I knew I wasn't going to be a ballet dancer. But she uses her, her talents, and so JB becomes a uh, dancer uh, on uh, the, the local nightclub circuit, then dances in um, Canada at a club run by a gentleman by the name of Monsieur Savard and she puts together a group with whom she dances and she choreographs called the Savard Dancers. She said that wherever she went, she would then also take ballet classes. So she wouldn't hang out at night in Montreal. She was taking classes with the National Ballet Company, that kind of thing. Later in the late 50s, 59, 60, she gets involved with the Larry Steele reviews, which were a big deal. They had these black reviews that would be in Atlantic City every summer. I went in as a dancer, then I ended up helping the choreographer, then I ended up being the choreographer. This is JB 
uh, on point for a publicity picture for the Larry Steele work. She is in a position that really shows us what her training is like. This is like a Cicchetti ballet position. Fortunately for me, I always work with top acts. Sammy Davis, Cab Calloway, Billy Eckstein, and just so many of that era. I was always lucky to have a good job. I was dancing with Pearl Bailey, and I just woke up in Boston in one of the raggedy hotels and said, I don't want to do this the rest of my life. Maybe if I go back home, teach some kids in Philadelphia, that maybe some of them will get the opportunity that I didn't get. 52nd and Walnut Street, there was a children's shop on the first floor, and I opened my school above them, thinking the kids went to buy their clothes, they would come by and see my school. I worked for six years in Atlantic City at night. I commuted every day for six years. I would teach in the morning, catch the bus at 8 o'clock, dance at the club at night, come back, catch the 6 o'clock bus in the morning. And my boss said to me, one day people are going to say, boy, you sure got a good break. Nobody's going to know how hard you worked. Then I moved to 52nd and Chestnut above a music school. Then my school had grown Then the facility was too small. That's when I moved to 63rd and Market when I got my second location in 1969. 7516 Ogons Avenue. A white woman had a school up there and the community was changing. So she said she wanted to sell her school but uh, she didn't really want to sell it because she wanted somebody to keep the school in the neighborhood. And so because that's where we live, that's where I went. My father retired from the service and because I took ballet class while we were in the service, a friend of the family said, well, why don't you come to Philadelphia School of Dance Arts? Once the dance bug hit me, it was all I wanted to do. 1970, my kids that I started when they were five, six, seven, eight years old, and now I'm 16, 17, 18 years old. And I'm like, you guys can dance, go to New York, go to California, to go. And, but they kept bouncing back. Maybe if I make a little dance group, and they'll get a little more experience, they'll get the bug and want to move and move out and move on. We would breathe, eat, sleep, dance. Miss Brown used to say, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, because we would be there all day, all night. Wherever there were events and they wanted dancers, we would dance. We went to Camden for the Department of Recreation. We kind of figured we were touring. <laughs> that was the beginning of our tour in Camden, New Jersey. I call it magic. You see something in a dancer that they're hungry, they want to dance, they give you their all, they show at an audition. We all see the same thing. It's not just me. You know, people say, did you see number seven? I'm like, yeah, I saw number seven. It's good training. And it has nothing to do with appearance so much as presentation. And da 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 da, and jump and pull back and down. I was number 14. I'll never forget that day because that day changed my thought process, my belief system, my imagination. It changed everything. And I met this incredible woman named Jo Myers Brown when I walked up those steps at 63rd Street. And she just, like embrace me without embracing me. I attended on a snowy day. It was like a blizzard, basically. And I didn't get in. <laughs> so, but I did the audition, it was fun. It was very um, eye-opening. And I think I tried the second time and the third time, and that was the charm. It was Philadelphia's premier African-American dance company. and. I wanted to be a part of that once I found out its history. I was fortunate enough to, to be there when Deborah Chase and Deborah Manning and David St. Charles and all of them were there, which couldn't have been a better time for me to be able to sit back and be like a fly on the wall and just observe, observe the masters at work. And almost 40 years later, I'm still here. I'm artistic director of our second company, uh, D2, our apprentice performance group. I teach for the school, the school, Philadelphia School of Dance Arts. So when they stopped dancing and they wanted to be involved, it was easy to hire someone who knew me and knew what I like and what I want. I say I recycle people. 
And we always say, going without the E. You're going, but you'll be back. There are so many notable dancers who've been part of this legacy. Going to Philodanko and seeing this array of dancers that looked like me, that spoke like me, that laughed like me, it was just incredible. And so I just felt at home and wanting to be a part of that. What's interesting is how many of them then went on to dance with Alvin Ailey. So there is a Danko tradition that is a, a very rich vein in the Ailey world. I joined the Ailey Company in 1981. It was just a dream of mine. I wanted to be a part of that experience. And fortunately, that happened for me. It doesn't happen for a lot of people, but it happened for me, and so I'm really grateful. Alvin and I got to be friends. And my favorite story is he asked me between the two Debbies which one he could have. So you gotta take them both. In every single way, she prepared us to go further than where we were in terms of just being disciplined, knowing how to conduct yourself as an adult, what's expected of you as an artist. The awareness, being able to, at a moment's notice, be flexible, change it up, figure it out, you can't buy that. When Mr. Ailey was alive, he would say, I already know that they're prepared because of where they come from, because I know what Joe Myers Brown expects. The objective here is to make the best artists, to create the greatest performers, teachers, mentors, right here in our own home. And when you have that, you, just, you don't have to go to New York. You don't have to go anywhere else because it's right here. She brings in then incredible choreographers. The deceased Jean Hill Sagan, whose dance says, but particularly La Valse, are still performed beautifully by the company. I had the privilege and the pleasure of working with Jean Hosegan, who was resident choreographer when I came into the company. And I have the great honor of remounting his works. None of these dancers of this generation had an opportunity to meet him. It really is important to me that they get the essence of who Jean Hosegan was, who Tally Beatty was, so that they understand how to approach the work. I would say to some of them that you would not have survived if Tally Beatty was still alive. <laughs> Just because um, his tactics, his tough, tough, tough love was tougher than some of them know. Um, and we just had to remind them that, you know, we are here and these works have survived because of the genius of them. Welcome everybody to the Coalition for Diaspora and Scholars Moving round table and discussion. 1988, and Joan Myers Brown had this amazing idea to call together those who were in the black dance sector to begin to deal with issues and situations through this conference at the time. We have folks coming from Germany, from Sweden, from Barbados, from Bermuda, from the UK. Joan Mars Brown is instrumental, not just in the US, but also for us in the UK. She's um, phenomenal. We see the work that she's been doing. She's paved the way for so, so many people. This is a time where we can just commune with each other and just hearing from others what their, not only what their challenges are still, as dancers and companies of color, black specifically. They see, yeah. mm. I do not represent judgment-free, unbiased. I represent something that is completely lopsided. <laughs> yeah. So, therefore, whatever I say is going to be twisted and manipulated and turned into something else. But also our successes. Joan's love and passion for dance is just, just so far beyond what I could ever imagine. She gives herself, she gives her all. If you ask her if she can't, she will find someone who can, working to make sure that our young people, our dancers, have the opportunities that she didn't have when she was uh, at her prime in her career. Then, of course, there is this incredible kind of reception that Danko gets in Europe 
where they really are seen as stars of a certain caliber that I would say is still not quite understood as their right in uh, the USA. When we look at companies like Philodanco, it is the stable for lots of the other big companies. So Ailey, you know, um, they've, the dancers have come from Philodanco. In fact, some of the dancers I train end up dancing in Europe because of the opportunity there. We've been to over 20 countries now. We went to Macedonia and we've been to Korea, Japan, you know, we've gotten around. <laughs> Okay, so you're, you're owed this amount from yeah. paying out all the money. So this is probably a duplicate check request, but it's the same money. No, it's right? another day because it's signed. I interviewed JB for 10 hours, but you know, over a course of yeah. period of time. She was fine as long as I did not get in the way of her daily responsibilities that as long as I wasn't in the way of the turning wheels. Yes, go ahead, you can write your book. JB can certainly make you sit up and perk up because she somehow makes you aware in a very chill way that you are in the presence of a presence, if you will. And I call it tough love. And she certainly uh, does not bite her tongue about what she thinks. People think of dance as recreation, not as a job. People say they want to dance, but they don't want to commit to the job. I make sure my dancers have 52 week contracts, which is very unusual, because I say if plumbers get paid, my dancers should be paid. It's a very particular and interesting dance culture personality that JB has. And in a sense, it can make you or break you. She's very demanding, very nurturing and nourishing at the same time. So it's, um, you have a boss, <laughs> but you have someone who loves you as a parent. It's like home with mom. You know that when they love you and it's tough love, and they still come back or still let you in that door, then that's real love. Ms. Brown had you know, a rough go of it herself. So I think she was just aware of what we would face in the real world, so to speak. If you're not prepared, chances will pass you by. So I didn't want that to ever be an excuse that they weren't qualified, weren't prepared, and if they wanted to move on. I tell my kids, don't move out, move up. She gives everything she can so that you don't have to worry about anything but dance. It's a standard of excellence that is not compromised. There's a comfort of knowing that those things are always, they're consistent with her, her brand. It's wonderful to be in this building, have the school kind of underneath us, on top of us, on the side of us, because the school came first. And to see these young students, these young dancers work to become the next Philodenko, from the youngest of four years old coming in the building to the eldest in the adult classes. They all know who Aunt Joan is. She's present to everybody. She knows every single student's name and the parents. <laughs> And if you missed a day last week, you know, she, she knows that. And that, that's care. That's nothing but love and care. Is it scary to hear she retiring? Of course it is. Is it necessary? Yes, it is. I worry because she's the first one in here and the last one to leave. It's amazing what she does day in and day out has never wavered, ever. Even when we all know that she's tired. And how can you not be motivated? to keep that going. What are you hoping your legacy is going to be, that there, people are going to say about Joan Myers Brown years from now? I don't know. I don't know what they're going to say. They say, now, you mean that old lady? Gives you a hard way to go? That's my legacy right now. I think the legacy is what she has fought for for so long, and the door she has opened for so many people, is that that continues to be, and excellence that she's built with her company, that that continues to be. And if it takes two of us, five of us, or six of us, that has to be our drive and a commitment for her.
Does she have a cash app or something? No. She is 88. 88, <laughs> that don't mean I'm stupid. But you don't have a cash app. <laughs> but she's always going to be somewhere in it. <laughs> I can't imagine it not. I think that also keeps her excited, you know, to see what the next thing is coming. What she's established here is so embedded in these walls. It's so embedded in the people that she's touched. She's here. <laughs>